I have spent the last month studying through the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is a crazy book. Like I have never seen before things. This is how powerful the Word is. If you just get in and read, you'll see things you've never seen. And God will speak to you in the midst of it. And um, the book of Daniel, is, half of it is prophetic, but half of it is wild stories. Some of you learned them from flannel graphs when you were a little kid. Some of you have seen it on cartoons, and some of you have heard the wild stories, but I took an investigative look into some of the wild stories. I've actually never preached from what I'm going to preach today in years of ministry all over. I have never, ever preached from this chapter today. And so, listen, I am going to be, I'm on the schedule preaching here in the future, and you don't want to miss, first of all, let me say, the guest that I said that's, that, that they showed that's coming, Taryn Anderson. Taryn Anderson, we were just at a conference, and the staff heard him, and basically every one of the staff said, we want you to bring Taryn to preach. You need to come here, Taryn, preach. He's a fantastic pastor. I was just with him in Arkansas this week at some strategic board meetings, and they were fabulous, and what a great man, and... Um, I'm, I'm excited about him coming, but I'm going to share from the book of Daniel. Now, I'm not going to do this in chronological order because the book of Daniel is not in chronological order. I've seen some things in there that, like, it's in a weird placement, but I begin to understand how God placed that book together. So now listen to me. I'm not going to go into the prophetic statements of Daniel and the dreams and the vision, but I want you to hear a story about probably one of the greatest heroes Probably a guy who, who blessed God more than he did. He served faithful as really as a, as a, a in, the, in, the, in the, how would I say this? Like in a legislative branch of four different kings. Different political stances, different views of the world, some of them were wicked kings. One of them gets saved. And then he serves all four of them. And the stories are incredible how he serves them. The story starts as God made a covenant with Israel. We all know that. And then, you know, covenant is a two-way agreement, right? And Israel kept falling like some of us. But then Israel would just like abuse that relationship and God would say, okay, I love you enough that I'm going to send your enemies to punish you. And when you had enough, raise your hand and I'll rescue you. And that's some of you. And me too. Come on, don't act holy. And they act like idiots and God said, okay. And so in this context, God raises up a country who was brutal, the Babylonians. And they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't obey. And God said, okay, watch this. And he lets, listen to this horrible story. Many of you would know these Jewish paintings. Babylon come in and pillaged Jerusalem and Israel. They killed all the great men and women who were of power, and they went into the temple, to God's temple. You know, the menorah, all the gold, all the beauty. And they ransacked it and stole it all. They took every piece of gold, every piece of silver, every holy thing, everything that was used to worship God, and they stole it all. Like it'd be somebody walking in there just taking everything and walked out laughing and mocking at Israel while their soldiers lay dead on the road. And they would build a big statue. Later, out of that gold, they would melt it down. And then they did something. King Nebuchadnezzar did something. He said, but wait a minute here. Let's find their youth, the smartest, the ones that are most intelligent, the ones, the ones that could rule, the ones that could have power, the ones who can remember, the ones who are beautiful, the ones without flaws, the ones without mistake. And let's take them and bring them into our courts. And let's build a school. And let's teach them our culture. And let's teach them our language. And let's teach them our ways. And we will brainwash them that they will become rulers of Babylon. 
And God said, okay, I'm going to enjoy this. And they captured one young man named Daniel, who was probably around 17 years old. Now listen, I'm going to presume a little bit. I don't know all the facts, but he was probably around 17 years old. His parents were probably killed or left in Jerusalem, plundered. And this young boy was taken captive. And instead of being rebellious, instead of being an idiot, he said, well, if God placed me here, I may be on foreign soil, but I'm still blessed. I'm still chosen. I'm still called. God's got something for me. So I'll learn what they want me to learn. I'll go through, but, but I'm still going to worship God. And we find the story basically in Daniel 1, 3. I'll just read a few passages for you as, as I start. And if you'll put the first passages up for me, guys, and let's rock through this. Then the king instructed his, I don't even know how you say his name. It's sort of like mine. It's very different. The master of his eunuchs to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants. Notice that. Why didn't he bring the kings? Because he killed them all. The king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had the ability to serve the king's palace, in whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And they begin that process. And as time moved along, they, Daniel and his three friends, and many of you may know these boys as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that's not their names. They had Hebrew names. And listen, this is what they did. They even tried to change their names so they would change their identity. That's what the devil's doing in America. That's what the devil's doing is trying to change identities and try to change who people really are and make you be somebody else. And this is the reason you've got to be yourself. This is the reason you can't go to school and be a people pleaser or worry about what everybody else thinks about you. You'll end up becoming something you're not. And at the end of the road, you'll be empty. And so they were having them eat. So listen, there were very strict dietary rules for, for Israel, for the Jewish people. And Daniel just said, now listen, Daniel wasn't an idiot about it. He didn't call them names and didn't protest and didn't freak out and didn't do dumb things. Daniel just said, hey, I'll be the best student you got. I'll be the best worker you got. I will, I, I'll, I'll do what you need me to do. But one thing I won't do is I will worship God and I cannot eat your food. And the, and the ruler said, well, that's, that's unacceptable. And Daniel said, well, just try us on this then. You let us eat our stuff, let them eat our stuff, and then go test us days later and see how we look. And we find the story that days later, all of a sudden, they looked at Daniel. Well, let, let's just read through it. Let's go, let's go to the next passage, if you will, for me. In Daniel chapter verse um, 117. Um, no, let me say it this way. They, they tested, and they looked better than the guys who hadn't eaten the meat. They looked better than the guys who hadn't eaten the, the Babylonian diet. They were anointed. They were fresh. They were powerful. And I just want you to know something. You are blessed people if you're walking with God. And you've let the world tell you, well, you don't have as much money. You're not as good. You're not as smart. Why have you listened to their lies? If you have Jesus in you, you're anointed. You're special. You should be shining as a light in a foreign soil. You are ambassador of God. You are chosen. You are better. You, you have the Holy Ghost in you. Why have you let them lie and say, well, you didn't do as good on your test or you're, you don't look as well. We should be unique and powerful and anointed. Shining as a light in a dark spot. But we've got to be smart about doing it. We have an election coming up, and my prayer is, Dan, and I've got a message to preach for you that I'm excited about, but Daniel served under four kings, and it's amazing how we as Christians get nasty and hateful and mean and worry. I mean, I hear Christians now saying, well, I didn't vote for the president. I'm not going to pray for him. Are you? I, I'm sorry. That's just goofy. I was going to say another word, but I won't say it. Man, it, would you, we can serve under wicked people. We can serve under holy, but we are Christians. And really, we have a king that's above this king. You understand God holds the kings in the, in the palm of his hand. 
He could put them in power and take them out if he wants. And we ought to be shining as light in this, in this crazy culture that we live in. We ought to be shining as world changers in this culture that we live in. Are you okay? You all right? Daniel stood against the culture, and God blessed him. God blessed him. I wrote down this. We should be attractive in a foreign culture. They should see. Now, listen, we all know there are Christians who stand out, but they stand out about the wrong thing. Don't look at me like you have some, some people that say they're Christian, I'm embarrassed of. But we ought to have Christians who are like amazing. Humble people, but powerful people. Faithful people. You know what, your work, you should excel above all the others. I mean, you hang in the corner of all the people complaining, gripping. They ought to know you as the most honest person, the most integrous person. You ought to be there early. You ought to be the one staying late. You ought to, ought to be the one sharing. Now, listen to me. There's wisdom in this. There's power in this. Because God will anoint you when you do that right. And should, God will set you at tables you should have never set. And God will give you jobs that you don't deserve. God will put you among people you should not be among just because you've shown yourself faithful, because you were the one serving, you were the one faithful. You, your boss ought to say, man, that's the most honest person I have here. That's the most faithful person I have. I'm preaching good, whether you want to believe it or not. You ought to be the best student. You may not be the smartest. You don't have to be. He's got to be seen as faithful and studying and serving. We ought to be powerful. We are blessed in the city, in the country. The problem is, is we don't act like it. Can, can I just say this? When people see your fruit, what do they see in you? See, you ought to be among, be able to be around a bunch of people who aren't saved and shine without being obnoxious and judgmental. They ought to like you because they all say there's something different. There's just something different about you. What is it that will, that, that will cause them to ask, that will cause them to be like, I, I know I'm preaching a little extra. I hope you hear this this morning. We should be king to people who rise to the top who work harder, who are faithful people. You know what that actually, listen to me, this is a nugget of truth. I don't hear a lot of people quote this passage. There's a passage when he talks about leaders in the church. And, there's a, and he talks about, Paul talks about deacons and raising people up and elders. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, Paul says this. He says, moreover, he's talking about who you choose as leaders in the church. And look what he says. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. Here's what he said. If you're, they're going to be a good leader in church, go to their boss outside and ask what they work like. Go ask their neighbors what kind of character they have. Because they may act holy in the church. But go find out what their work record's like. Go find out oh, what their, Hello? I mean, truthfully, like me, you ought to be able to go ask my racing friends, what's Daner like at the track? Does he compromise? Does he carry on? Is he? Hello? They must have a good testimony outside lest he fall into reproach like the snare of the devil. Can't be prideful. Just be humble, loving, caring, showing concern for others, but being faithful to God, not compromising. And you cannot compromise, and you don't have to be an idiot about it. Because too many Christians act like non-Christians. Let, let me tell you what they do. They sin. That's what they do. I, th I think this is going over your head. I don't know. <laughs> Help me, God. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego become faithful men who stood the test and God promoted them. Now here's the key. Then he give them another test. 
every time you're tested, you've got to say in your heart, I want you to say it out loud, test equals promotion. Now, don't act weird because we know that's how it works everywhere, right? You, see, look, we freak out when we're in a test as adults, but when your third, when your third grader comes and say, Mom, I have a big test on Friday, you don't freak out on the teacher because you know that's how you, right? Look, you've got to study. Work on your test. Let's, that's how you make it to fourth grade, right? Why is it our kids understand it, but we as adults don't understand that? This morning, I'm going to talk about the fires you face and the troubles that you face and the troubles, but it was all about promotion. Here was the deal. God promoted Daniel. God promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but God said, I've even got other tables for you to sit at. I even want to do greater things, but I've got to know your heart before you get there. Joseph, I want to make you on the right hand of an evil king, but I've got to know your heart before you get there. Moses, I want to put you. Job, I want to do something for you. And so I said to the devil, go ahead. Let's see what's in him. And at the end, Job walked out doubled of everything he started with. Doubled of everything that he started with. So some of you need to realize the fire, when I use the word fire, I'm talking about the test. The fire you face is brought to see if you're ready for promotion. The fires that you're going to go through will put you in a reposition you for a promotion if you'll allow them to work. And I've preached that many times. You can learn or you can go around the mountain again and learn all over again. We find these boys as they enter into a place of fire. Now listen to me close. Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue because he wants to be God. Nebuchadnezzar was wicked. But God wanted to do not only a work in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and in Daniel, God wanted to do a work in Nebuchadnezzar. And now he's gonna depend on these three young boys to do the work to show Nebuchadnezzar that God was real. And if you'll dig deep in the book, you'll realize Nebuchadnezzar comes to the Lord at the very end. Because three boys passed the fiery test. The proof. So your fiery test. So he built a statue and said, bow down to it. You will be tested of who you will bow to. It's really an ultimate place. Who will you worship? Money? Your job? Hello, sports. I watch people sell Jesus out for sports all the time. Sell church out for a job. You prayed for the job, got the job. Now they want you to work on Sunday and not get involved in church. Well, I'm preaching a little bit hard here, Pastor Damon. But the truth is the truth. I want you to understand something. Nebuchadnezzar loved these young boys, really wanted to help them. It was their friends that turned on them and said, they're not bowing when they're supposed to bow. Now listen to me, for them not to bow, you understand what it was going to cost them? They're going to lose their job. They're going to lose, lose their stature. They're going to lose their education. They're going to lose their position. They're going to lose everything. They're going to lose their houses. They're going to lose their favor. They're going to be thrown out of the king's house. And so not to bow is a huge cost. And sometimes God will put a huge cost in front of you to see if you will bow. And many times it will come to this. Listen to me close. It will be a matter of you saying, I'm willing to risk it all because I believe you're greater, God. I'm willing to risk the friendship. I'm willing to risk the job. I'm willing to risk. You will face that test at one point or another to see who you will bow to. And you will all bow to something but it's our choice who. Are you all right? The fires we face, will you handle them? Let's read Daniel's chapter 3, 12 through 19, and then we'll just go on 20 and 22. There are certain Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve our gods or worship the gold image which you've set up. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true? Can I tell you what's really happening here? Nebuchadnezzar's pleading with him, guys, don't ruin all you got. You know, I placed you on the stage. What are you risking getting off for? Just bow down, do it. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to destroy you. And listen, Nebi, you talk, Nebuchadnezzar was wicked. And he's begging the boys not to do it. And listen to their answer. Why have you not bowed to the gods which I have set up? Verse 15. Now, if you are ready at the time to hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, the kinds of music, listen, music sets atmosphere. Be careful of the music you, you listen to because it sets atmosphere. In symphony with all kinds of music, you'll fall down and worship the image which I have made. Good. You know this image that possibly stood 90 feet tall. Outlaid with gold, probably melted down from the temple. Outlaid in gold. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? That's political power, and that's no different. Now, let me say something. I believe this, with, and I'll say this boldly. America is the greatest nation there is. But it still is about its political power wanting you to bow to their commands. Republican, Democrat, independent, any of it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Here's what they're saying. You really know our heart. And the next verse says, If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. It was a common practice to burn people in this furnace. And I don't know all this furnace looked like, but I do know it was built inside of a mountain. We can still find them in Israel at um, um, Caesarea Philippi where they have an opening at the end of the mountain where they would throw fire but you would have to walk up the mountain there would be this chimney thing where they could throw people down and burn them. And there in Israel they would sacrifice their babies to show that, that they would worship God. He says that is the case our God whom we're able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace he will deliver us from your hand. O king. But notice the next part. But if not but if not, you know what they're saying? If he does, he does. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But we're still not bowing. We're still not bowing. You will be tested at a time where you risk it all for really serving God. And we'll see where you stand. What we call Christian in America, pay attention to me one second. I got to say this. It's been burning in me. Most people will tell you they're a Christian and they think just because they were married in a church or they attended a service or they had a burial of their family member in a church or because their culture says they're Christian, that they're Christian. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. We struggle as, as, as pastors at times looking at people. Everybody dies. Everybody thinks they all go to heaven. Oh, they're looking down. Maybe they're not. Because Jesus said, more go there than here. I didn't say it. He did it. The road is narrow to the kingdom of God. And I don't, I don't mean that in mean, but I'm just telling you, this is, this is a real commitment. This covenant serious. But it will propel you. It will promote you. It will make you better than what you could have ever done. If you really walk with God, he's for you. And if he's for you, who is against you? Who can stop you? And so the three boys say, he's God. And so if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor we will worship the golden image which you have set up. They basically said, do what you got to do. And we'll live with the consequences because we trust him better than your fiery furnace. We trust him better than your threats. We trust him better and we will be faithful to our God. Because here's the point. Jesus is always watching what you're doing. 
Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. Notice he changes. Full of fury. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the fiery furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Isn't that funny? Usually that's how trials happen to Christians is usually it's not only a fire, it's usually heated hotter than it said to be. Because the devil's out after you. It's not one person attacking you, it's three at the same time. Come on, the, 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 the furnace got heated up. And in verse 18, let's read on, guys. We go back to verse, um, was we in 19? Okay, good. And he, com- and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And he cast them where? To the burning, fiery furnace. Let's read on. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their garments. Put that in your pocket. All right, we'll, tell, we'll talk about that in a minute. And cast them in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, there was chaos happening. He, Nebuchadnezzar freaked out, and when he freaked out, everybody jumped to it because he'd kill you if you didn't do what he told you to do. And there's chaos, and so these guys are rushing these guys up the mountain with their clothes on, tie some ropes on them, and they're trying to hurry to throw them down into the fire. And, and the commands are urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know what happened, but there's a lot of scholars that say somehow the wind just shifted. If you paid any attention to Hawaii and the terrible, tragic fires that just burnt up, there were houses. Now, I knew tornadoes did this, but I didn't know fires did this. There were houses left still standing untouched that 25 houses in a row burnt, and the wind blew that fire somehow. I don't know how up over that house onto the next house and burnt those. And I've seen interviews of people and buildings and like three churches that were left standing. They're like, I don't know. Every part's burnt over here. Every part's burnt. But we didn't even lose a shingle. And somehow this fire that was raging in this furnace, I don't know how it happened. There must have been a wind shift. God caused the wind to shift. There must have been a wind shift that took that fire that should have killed these guys when they were at the entrance and never hurt them but killed the guys trying to throw them in the fire. And here's my point, number one, if you'll put it up for me, please. Sometimes God uses the fire to punish your enemies. Sometimes the very fire the the devil will put you in will end up punishing him. Ask Joseph. Because at the end, Joseph said, the thing you meant to harm me really repositioned me and helped me. Ask Job. Can I tell you when this church started moving and and exploding and growth and great things happening, when they came, when we were doing a multicultural church and they came and they super glued our locks and wrote blank lovers on the walls and busted out our windows with a firecracker, that's when we grew. What the devil meant to destroy, God used to let us grow. The very trial you're in right now may reposition you and put you in a place of victory if you'll act right in the midst of your hell. I have to be careful saying this, but we went through hell building the other parking lot, building that building over there, and the city put us through terrible stuff. Terrible stuff. And the last time we were in court, there was an elderly lady that she may seem nice on the inside, but she wasn't, but full of the devil on the inside. And I was, Ada, it was killing me because I watched her in front. Now, listen, I wasn't allowed to speak because I filed a petition, but she stood up in front of the court and said, that pastor, everything he's promised, he's never done. And I'm listening. And, and the guy who's representing us is going, Dana. <laughs> Don't say a word. He put his hand on my leg and squeezed it. (laughs) You told them they had to build a retention pond, and they didn't do it. We were never told. They were total lies. 
total lies. And then they shut down court and went and looked back at the records to see if we were lying. And they come back and said, well, no, they never had. They did do, oh, well, this. And, and she just lied and lied and lied and lied and cost us thousands of dollars. Cost us thousands of dollars. And I'm saying, Lord, she lives right over there if you want to know where she's at. I'm just fessing up. I'm telling you the truth. When I drove home, my first thought was, I'm going to go knock at her door. <laughs> Pastor Damon, am I telling the truth? I was mad. But I realized how I respond now will affect my future. And I just, I, I cried. I mean, I didn't cry too. I, was, I, just, I just kept talking to myself, saying, God, and talking, God, I stop right here. You got it. You know what's happening. You know the lies. You know the crap that's going on. It's costing you the money. It's not mine. It's yours. You gave us this idea. This lady's doing it. I guess you do whatever you want. If you want to bless her, then bless her. But I have no part in it. I won't say anything. But now listen to this. You'll love this little story. It was only months until I think Aunt Dr. Anna was running a, a bingo class at that time over there, or, or a euchre class. Come to find out that night she was over there. Yeah, she come. Rodney seen her, and Rodney come over to me and put his arm around me, said Pastor Dana. He walked me right out the back door. And I didn't even know. Later on, he told me, you know who that was there? I'm like, what are you talking about? That was her. I said, why didn't you let? I say all this to tell you this story. Recently, we've had two major events that have taken place. Many of if you've been here, part of the church for years, if it rains really bad, the sewers back up out front on the road. And the city now has realized they did a major mistake building all the houses and all the sewers, and they have nowhere else to go but our land. And so they hire a, a citizen's energy group, attorneys and uh, engineers, and a whole pack of them came to us and said, we need your help. I said, who sent you? The city. Okay, let's talk. They entered this big proposal, and they were trying to take some of our parking lot. And I said, look, let it be. at the end of the day, just let me tell you, I'll do whatever I can help. This. I love this city. I pray for this city. And I'm a man of God. I believe in our community. But I'll not let you take one parking spot. Not one. Not one. Now, if you want to do something, I said, let's walk outside. I said, you see that house over there? <laughs> Pastor Damon, come on. <laughs> see that house over there? They just come back to us. No, it's not a done deal. But then the trail's going in over there, and the trail come asking me for help. I said, let's talk. Now I've got them to work. Now they've come back and said, we would like to build you. And all the we would like to build you a brand new parking lot of 200, call, like two, what's the number? 110. I thought it was more like 200. 110, I'll take Damon's word. Uh, but listen, you, do you know asphalt means fuel? It's high dollar. We want to build you a new parking lot and build you a, we want to move that playground that's over, we want to build you a beautiful one over here, and we'll do it all, and we'll pay it all, and we'll, and at the end of the meeting, I said, hey, how about a new sign? <laughs> but I realized, look what God did. God put me in a place of humiliation and devastation and hurt, because I'm thinking, God, I just got brutalized in court. I mean, my character was attacked horribly, and I never did lie about it, but I got accused, and they were all looking at me like I was like some scoundrel. 
But God took us from that position to all of a sudden they come to my front door and said, let's talk. Now who's in a position of power? How are you handling your test? It may reposition you. Maybe it's your next promotion. Maybe it's your next promotion. Sometimes God uses the fire. Sometimes God uses the wind to punish your enemy. The second major thing here happened in verse 23 that we read, they survived the fall. How did they end up going down the furnace all the way down in the ground? We're not even talking about the fire. We're not even talking about being bound. We're not talking about how they survived the fall. How did they survive that hit? I mean, I got thinking about it, and I realized fire, if you put a point number two for me, fire reveals God's protection. Now, here's the issue. Some of you don't know what protection is because you've never been threatened. It's like a, when I joined the Navy, they said, we've given you clothes that will cause you to float if the boat sinks. I hated this little white hat they had. You all know that little hat? Like, it's a little cone head that bends up on the corner. And they, but I didn't know. They said, okay, well, here's the deal. If the boat sinks, that hat will cause you to float. I said, that dumb looking hat couldn't. You fold it straight out. You take it behind your back. Boom. On the water, all of a sudden, air pops up in that hat. You put your neck over it, and it will cause you to float in the ocean. They threw us in the water and said, test it. I mean, I know how to swim, but I'm thinking, I don't want that. That, that hat's not going to save me. It didn't look like it would until I tried it. They said, the pants you wear, take them off, tie your legs together, tie each leg together, put it in a knot, tie them together, put it over the back, hold your waist, hold it over the back, and go, boom, the legs fill full of air. Put your neck right in And your pants will cause you to float. God, your floating device, the real issue, though, you've never let him put you in a place where you really need protection, but he will cause you to float. He will cause you to be protected. He will take care of you through the fire, through the flood. So the water is some through flood and some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through the water. Ask some Noah. Through the flood. Yeah. Ask Moses. And some through the fire but all through the blood. Some of you survived the fall, the divorce that you thought was going to kill you. You're still praising, and you're still worshiping, and you still got your hand lifted up. The people that failed you and walked away from you, you're still standing. You got your hands up. You're still praising. You're still giving. You're still serving. You've not quit. The sickness that tried to kill you, you're now back on your feet and still praising God, still worshiping God. You've learned that he's a protector through the hell, through the fire, the flood, through the tragic events in your life. Some losses that you faced, you're still standing. You survived the fall. You survived the fall. You're going to survive the fire if you'll trust him through it. He can handle the fall. He can handle what they do to you. He's got it. He's got you in the palm of his hands. Some through the fire and some through the flood. Verse 24 and 25. Pastor Damon, I'm running out of time. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke to this thing to his counselors. 
Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered, oh, king, it's true. Stay there. Don't go ahead yet. I, I don't, I, that bottom must be somehow you could see in there in that fire. And when Nebuchadnezzar's looking in, he's counting. One, two, three, four. Wait a minute. One, two, four. And he turns around and goes, guys, how many people we put in that fire? They answered, oh, true, king, we put three in there. Verse 25. Look, he answered, I see four men. Listen, not laying on the ground, pouting, blaming, cursing, being nasty. How you act in your fire. Because you know what the devil does? The devil throw you in the fire and then say, God did it to you. And then mock you and say, look, God's not even helping you. He'll tempt you to sin, then condemn you for sinning. And it's the devil saying, if God was real, he wouldn't have did this to you. If he was alive, if he was all powerful, as Pastor Daner said, you wouldn't be here. But he counts, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire. I don't know what's all read here, but I think, and I'm, 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 not, I'm not telling you thus, saith the Lord, but I think I see in the language, they must have been in there jumping and shouting and praising and worshiping God. They weren't freaked out. They weren't trying to get out. They weren't panicked. They weren't screaming that they were in. They realized they were in the fire, but when they got in the fire, they found somebody there they didn't expect. And my next point says this. Fire reveals God's presence. It's in the fire you'll meet him. It's in the fire that you'll find out who he is. I don't know about you. I didn't grow up in church, and I didn't meet God in church. I didn't meet God at the flannel graph. I didn't meet God when I got older in the church. It was when I was in the midst of the hell, and my wife said she was dying, and my life was at a rescue. My life was at a horrible point that all of a sudden God showed up in the midst of the fire and said, here I am in the midst of the burning fire, and he changed me. And some of you were saved in the fire. Some of you need to rejoice. The fire's not killing you. It actually revealed you a different place of God, a deeper sense of who God is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never seen God until they got in the fire. And I guarantee you, if they were alive today, they would stand and say, it was the fire that was the greatest thing I ever experienced. It was the fire that did it for me. That's why you'll just have to excuse me when I praise him. Have to excuse somebody back here standing because somebody got saved in the fire. Somebody got saved in the hell. And they're like, you'll have to excuse my praise. You'll have to excuse the way I act. You'll have to excuse me for being a little bit excited on Sunday morning. Maybe I jump a little bit. Maybe I dance a little bit because I got saved in the fire. Somebody needs to rejoice that got saved in the fire. Excuse these people. They just got saved in the rough point. You don't have to excuse my praise, friend, but I got saved in the fire, and I'm going to give him some praise. Saved in the fire. Saved in the fire. Now I'm going to prophesy to you. Some of you, there's a handful of people in this church that the enemy's about, regret, about ready to regret that he threw you in the fire. Because God is going to reveal something to you and God's going to promote you. Kimmy, God's going to take you to another place through the hell that you feel like you're in and open a new door. And some of you will look back and say, it was the fire. It was the fire that caused me to be repositioned and caused me to grow. It was a fire. It was a fire. Jeremy, what's the song say? Do it, do it. 
sun through the water and some through the flood and some through the fire but all through the blood. all through the blood Woo. yeah This is why the Bible says, let it count it all joy when you face various trials. Remember the passage in James? Verse 26 and verse 27. I got to hurry. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the, fiery, the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Oh, why? You just said, who is this God? See, well, you don't realize your fire is speaking to somebody else that's watching you go through it. See, what you don't realize, God's going to save Nebuchadnezzar and has a plan. And then these three young boys don't realize that. They don't know that years down the road, Nebuchadnezzar is going to bow his knee. And this is the first sign that would cause Nebuchadnezzar to say, this, this, this God, there must be something to this God. And he says, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. Come walk it out. Come walking out. Come walking out. Verse 27 says, and then the satraps and the ministrators, the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and they saw these three men on whose bodies the fire had no power. Here's what they're thinking. Their hair's not singed. Their clothes as clean as they were when they come out, when they went in. They saw these men in bodies that fire had no power. The hair of the head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of the fire was not. They said, smell them. They don't even smell like they've been in the smoke. This is the reason some people don't understand your testimony. Because they don't smell any smoke on you. But they don't know you've been through the fire, baby. They don't understand your praise. They don't know you've been through the hell. You went through the brokenness. You went through the addictions. You went through the troubles. You went through the separation. But you survived it. Maybe you just ought to say to your neighbor and tap them on the shoulder lightly and say, I'm sorry if I acted a little wild, but you just don't smell the smoke that I've been through. You don't smell the fire that I've been through. But let me tell you something, baby. I've been through it. But God was faithful. But God was faithful. God was faithful. God was faithful. God was faithful. Let my praise be my testimony. The divorce was bad, but it didn't kill me. Let my testimony tell you the sickness was bad, but it didn't stop me. My job loss almost killed me, but I'm still paying the bills, baby. I'm still making it. I'm still surviving. I'm still here. I'm still tithing. I'm still serving. I'm still giving. You may not smell the smoke, but I was in it. But God was faithful to bring me through it. There are cl they're clothes, and I have to hurry. Damon's time is done. And you do know he's the boss, and I have to obey. Listen to me closely. Their clothes identified who they were. In the fire, they never lost their identity. They came out still identified as the one with God's favor, as the one on God was chosen. I told you a few weeks ago when they came out of the fire, they went in with their hands bound, and the only thing that got burned up was what was binding them up. They went in bound and came out free. They went in bound and came out. They went in like this and come out like, woo! Look what God did. Smell me. Smell me. Look at my hair. I guess Jeremy would be saying, I'm still shining up there, Lord. Look at it. I'm still shining. I'm still shining. The ropes are gone and I'm free. That's what they were saying. 
the fire is going to set you free. The fire is going to set you free. The fire is going to set you free. Stop complaining. Stop giving up. Stop throwing in a towel. Trust God on a new level. Make a new decision. Some of you will need to come to the altar and say, God, through the fire, through the flood, and I have to close with this point, never in my last point, just simply this. Verse 28 through 30 says this. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, blessed be the God. Blessed be the God of, you just called him out and said, who is he? How is it now he? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language that speaks anything amidst the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut off in pieces and their houses shall be made in an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So when I close with these thoughts, two quick thoughts. The story reads on, the boys were promoted again. And now... Their boss said, anybody touch him, it's off with your head. See, when you come out of your fire, you're going to get promoted. Show God that you trust him. Why freak out that he gives you tests? That's what we do to our kids. I've seen many of you school pictures. Oh, this is my kids entering into fourth grade. Yeah, because they graduated third. You just ought to be talking about your graduation date. That's the only thing you need to be talking about. And then comes promotion. And then the last thing, the la and the fire not only brought, if you'll put up point number five when I'm closing, fire brings your promotion and God's praise. This day, Nebuchadnezzar began to acknowledge God. He would turn and do some other things, but eventually God would arrest his heart. Stand on your feet with me. If you're in the fire today, I'm just going to open the altars. If you don't know Jesus, you can start today. As these two sing with us this morning, we want to open the altars. If you've got kids, please check out your children. You can come back over with us and worship. But some of you need to rejoice in the fire today. Some of you need to rejoice in the flood today.